It's the only podcast on earth with one two-time MLB All-Star, one comeback player of the year, Dimitri Young. We have Petey Williams, a Canadian destroyer from Impact Wrestling. How's she going, eh? And then one of my favorite people of all time, from the band Rancid, Lars Fredrickson. Well, you know what? Out of all of the intros, mine was the weakest, Dennis. That's kind of a bum out. Well, well, hold on. Then I'll do you one better, all right? And then we got our producer, (laughs) the undisputed Dennis Farrell. Dennis, say hi. Yeah, hi. Wait, I don't get a chance of redemption here with Lars. No, no, no. I'm just playing with you, Dennis. Words hurt, man. Words hurt. Well, listen, we will get to a lot of the housekeeping stuff here, kind of mid-show. Uh, Fight Network, we're excited to be here. Our second show, the very first guest that we've handpicked, the one that we've been after P.D. Williams for for the longest time. I've been a huge fan. I know Dimitri and I, we go back and forth on text all the time. Lars was initially, the guy was like, hey, for the very first female on the show, in, in this incarnation of the show, PD, reach out to Jordan Grace. Make sure she be the first because we are all big fans. We love what she's doing. PD reaches out. Here she is, Fight TV Wrestling Perspective, Jordan Grace. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on. First off, before we hit you with the questions, and this is the second time in two podcasts we've had to do this, but happy birthday. Thank yeah. You. Oh. <laughs> I probably ate about 10,000 calories yesterday, guys. It's all I did. The entire day was eat. I'm so jealous oh, of you. Same so here. Jealous. I, I, I did a lot of prep for this podcast, and most of it was listening to you on the Tommy Dreamer podcast, which Tommy's a friend of the show. I, I thought that was a phenomenal podcast. And it made, me, it made me think of different questions to ask you that, and I didn't share with these guys because I'm sure they're going to ask you those same questions. But – I, the first question I kind of want to hit you with, and it's going to start out as a disrotation because I want you guys to go with me on this journey. But you're married to a Ring of Honor talent, which we'll talk about here in a few. And then this whole Forbidden Door thing is opened, and a lot of us fans want to romanticize about would it be great if Jordan wrestled her husband? And for a lot of, and I'm a fanboy, but for a lot of us fanboys, we don't really think of. Do their styles clash? Does it work? Would it make sense? Blah, blah, blah. And you've probably been hit with this question a million times. But is A, wrestling your husband on national TV something that you would be A, interested in? B, do you feel like your styles would mix well in the ring? So it's it's funny that you say that fans romanticize about, you know, the, the forbidden door because I think even more so than the fans romanticizing it, I think the wrestlers are doing it so much as well because like that's been on everybody's topic of conversation every time I talk to another wrestler is like man it'd be awesome if this company and that company work together blah 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 um but to answer your question yes I do think our styles would mesh very well together because styles clashes are what make matches and me and John are very stylistically different in that he is a technical wrestler who literally like he's never done a powerbomb before probably I don't know but that's just off the top of my head probably not and that's like all I do is I lift people up and we're around the same size so I feel like we could stylistically mesh very well so Jordan well now that we're already on the talk of of John I mean I might as well hit you with it so I've never been like in a relationship with uh, like a female wrestler or anything like that Uh, this isn't a proposal to you you're married all right so um (laughs) Do you and John ever, I just want to know, like for my own brain, because I've been doing this for 20 years, do you guys ever talk wrestling? Do you talk a lot of wrestling or do you guys like never talk about it or like it just depends or does your whole life revolve around wrestling? Like how, how does that work? Yeah, our entire life revolves around wrestling. His more so than mine because he is just like, his mind is 24 seven wrestling and he, he will talk to me most of the time and I'll just like be like, you know, on my phone or something and just they'll just talk and talk for hours and hours and I'll just be like, yeah, that's totally cool. Blah, blah, blah. Like he's so, he thinks about wrestling so in depth that I don't think I could ever get on his level at this point. Like it's just, it's too far beyond me. Um, We do also argue about wrestling a lot because he doesn't, he doesn't like a lot of, uh, he doesn't like a lot of like wrestling, like the, the, the high spots they do now. Mm. He likes, you know, like traditional style wrestling, like like chain wrestling, Matt, yeah. 
Yeah, stuff like that. So that's where we differ too. Like I'll see like an awesome GIF online of like, like I saw a, a, a GIF of Jeff Cobb. I think it was last night. He did like some kind of crazy pop-up powerbomb and then he did something into his finisher. And I was like, check this out. And John was like, well, what, what, what that's, what's that about? What does that do? And I was like, oh, God, you don't understand. <laughs> Everybody has their own style. I, I mean, I get, yeah. I, I understand, but okay. He loves technical wrestling. <laughs> Hey, Jordan, I just, I'm a big fan ever since you hit Impact Wrestling. I'm a former Major League Baseball player, played 13 years, been a big wrestling fan throughout my career. So when you came into Impact Wrestling, you were just literally just running through everybody. But my favorite part was when you challenged Rohit Raju for the X Division title, and you actually won it. And, and, and the fact that there was a world champion that was a woman, and then you taking. I, I want you to to continue being an X Division champion. I just thought that was so cool. I hate that they dropped the that Impact dropped the ball with that because I think you could have done great things with the X Division title. Yeah, I think I think the same thing, and I don't think you know that is necessarily over. I just think there's a time and place for it. Um, hopefully, when there's actually fans around. <laughs> yeah, definitely that. <laughs> You know, one of the things I wanted to ask is the psychology, especially, you know, because you in, in your career obviously wrestled women and you've also wrestled men. Do you have to kind of think about that in a psychological way when you're building the match because of your opponent is, is a different gender or whatever that is? That's always been curious to me. So I don't think it's necessarily that they're a different gender. I think you have to base psychology a lot on people's size. Like if I wrestled someone like Marco Stunt, I wouldn't necessarily say I'd be wrestling around his gender. Um, like if, I, if I'm wrestling Jessica Havoc, it's going to be a completely different match than if I'm wrestling Marco Stunt, right? Regardless of the gender. But if I'm wrestling Brian Cage, it would be probably a similar match as I'm wrestling Jessica Havoc because, because they're both so much bigger than me. So I think it's more of a size thing than a gender thing. Yeah, because I mean, I've, I saw your match with Brian Cage and that's why I was asking because, you know, obviously the, the bodies are very different. You know what I mean? I'm just thinking like, well, how do you approach that? You know what I mean? And from your perspective, that's all. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. And I mean, you have to make it realistic. I think that's one of the, the biggest things, you know, like you don't want a guy to typically just outright punch a girl in the beginning of the match. That's normally frowned upon. I, I view you as a fan as one of the leaders in the women's revolution, even though it was tagged from a different company that. Do you, do you feel like a leader? Because I kind of feel like that whole women's revolution was hijacked by a different company, turned into a tagline, and then a marketing ploy when it was kind of really the independent women. You were one of the ones that stood out in my mind. Do you, do you almost feel like it became cheapened as you guys, you know, slowly – moved up the ladder, became X Division world champions, and then you have another company that gets applauded because they have a, a Royal Rumble, which should have happened 10 years ago? I don't necessarily feel like it's cheapened. And I also, I do feel like a leader, but I don't feel like my generation at Impact started the Women's Revolution. I think it started a long time ago with Gail Kim and when they brought in people like Hamada and just girls like that that's where I really think it started it started a long time ago so I don't think it's ever been cheapened and I'm actually glad that WWE you know started putting more of an, an emphasis on their women's wrestling so you know I don't hold any ill will to them at all because I just want to see women's wrestling thrive regardless of where it's at you know, and that's interesting you say that because you look at you know wrestling nowadays and there's not a lot of ever, like first evers anymore it seems like everything's been done but you were a part of a first ever, I believe, I think it was the first ever in Impact, the 30-minute the Iron Man match, like, but for, for females. Um, yeah. How, how, how was that? Have you ever been in one before? I've never been in an Iron Man match at all. And we actually didn't even know it was going to be an Iron Man match until the morning of. They didn't tell us anything. It was supposed to be a last, not, last knockout standing match. And they were like, you know, what we've never done before ever is an Iron Man match. And they told us, and I was like, oh, my God. I've not done enough cardio for this. Like, <laughs> I'm not prepared. <laughs> well, what goes into the psychology of that? Because 
in my mind now, you go from having to play in a 10 to 15 minute match to adding an extra 45 minutes on it without making it look ho- ho- hokey with a 20 minute headlock. How do you guys, how was, can you walk me through that process of that day where that unrolls for you? So actually, once I found out that it was going to be a 30 minute, 30 minute Iron Man match, I actually called John because this is kind of like, his expertise is super long matches. Like my, my sweet spot's like 12 minutes, but he usually his matches go at least 30 minutes and he's done matches that have been over an hour before. Um, and so when he, I told him that it was only a 30 minute Ironman match, because normally it's like an hour long, he was like, Oh, that'll be super easy. And then basically the psychology he explained to me was like, you know, it's more difficult without a crowd because you can't work them or anything. Mm-hmm. So we just started this match slow. I think we we wrestled probably like for 15 minutes, like just mat wrestling stuff. And then it wasn't like really action packed until like the last eight to 10 minutes. And then we kind of did like a normal match so that we conserved our energy up until that point. And then we just kind of hit a sprint at some point and just tried to make the end exciting. Well, I'm kind of interested in, the, in what you have going on now with um, Jazz. And um, has she been like a mentor, so to speak, because of her longevity in, in the wrestling game and her going way, way back to WWE and, and Rodney Mack and all that stuff? Like, I know she's probably a mentor. Who who else was a mentor for you as you, you came into this game and to where you are now? So first of all, I love Jazz. She's become one of my favorite people ever. I knew her before she came to Impact, but since we've been tagging, she's like one of the coolest, best people I've ever met. Um, And I hope she stays around Impact for a long time. I think a lot of people are pushing for that now. Uh, But when I first came into wrestling, uh, one of my mentors, who's actually Canadian too, I don't know if you know her necessarily, but I know Pete. It was Lefisto. (laughs) Lefisto was one of the top people. (laughs) <laughs> that helped like mentor me when I first started not I would think I was like five years in when I met Lefisto, but that was kind of when I started to hit my stride and you know take advice more seriously and she was one of the people that helped me along you you mentioned that and on the Tommy Dreamer podcast you talk about I, I almost I don't want to use the word of lack of training but the picture you drew of how you were trained doesn't sound very typical for someone of your talent now into where you are so and and guys go back and listen to the tommy dreamer podcast with her i don't want to give too much away here but with that being said how do you go from point a to point impact wrestling with that limited amount of training where was your turning point who stepped in to pick up where you know your initial training left off yeah, so I think you you kind of hit uh, the nail on the head there when you say lack of training because I really feel like that's – I kind of just, like, trained for three months, and then I started touring Mexico immediately, which is definitely not typical. Um, so I feel like I almost – all of my first matches in, like, years, years and years of my first matches, that was my training. So that's – probably why it took me 10 years to actually get signed to a company because I was just so terrible for all that time. And I was just, you know, (laughs) wrestling three, three to four matches a week. And that was my training. So it was kind of like on the job training, I guess you could call it. Um, I would say, I don't necessarily know who stepped in, but I knew, I know I did a lot of seminars um, starting from when I was like 18, you know, to like 20 and did a ton of seminars and, you know, something just clicked, you know, maybe eight years in, (laughs) finally, I was a late bloomer. And I was just like, well, you know, I need to find out like who I am as a wrestler. And I found out that I'm like, you know, I need to be this power wrestler. And so that's just what I started doing. And, you know, how I started calling my matches and how I started telling the stories of my matches. And it just, I think it really, it really started to work. It, follow up question, guys, before you jump in, and then I'll step back for a certain time and let you guys ask your questions. But Eek. <laughs> thanks, bud. Now, uh, by the time I get to my question, I'm going to forget it. So go ahead. <laughs> oh, thanks, guys. Uh, you, you know, when you when you mentioned that, when did it click then for 
you know, the working out because your transformation body wise has been phenomenal, well documented. You've been very proud of it. And I, I'm a big fan. At what point into your wrestling training career, did you, did it just kind of click for you? And then you started to move in that direction as well. Um, probably around the time I actually started like training, like to do powerlifting seriously. Um, and that was maybe only about three years ago was when I finally was just like, okay, I'm going to start doing these powerlifting competitions again. And that's how I trained like all the time. I would just lift super heavy and not care about anything else. I barely did any kind of cardio or stretching or functional training. I would just lift as heavy as possible. And I feel like, uh, I finally, found a balance to where I've integrated some, you know, mobility work and stretching and stuff like that. Like now I feel like I know my body well enough to know when I need to take a break, when I can lift super heavy, like, and now that I've been wrestling 10 years, my body, it, it can't go like it used to. So I feel like those mob mobility days, I have to do those way more than anything else now. Well, you know what, when, when I've been watching you over the years, one of the things that you kind of really strike for me is you kind of got like this throwback sort of style with, with yourself. And so, and you said that it's taken you a long time throughout your career to kind of, you know, train or whatever you were training pretty much on the job. W what was that one moment where you were kind of like the, the hesitation stopped and the fluidity, fluidity happened with you in a match with, with a certain opponent? Was it somebody that you were wrestling a lot or, or was it just, just practice and practice and practice. I don't know if I can pinpoint an exact moment, but I remember a match that happened. I think it was in 2016 or 2017. I was actually wrestling Canada for a company called C4. Uh, it was one of their women's shows. And uh, there I wrestled a girl named Alexia Nicole. And I actually won like, I think it was like the best performer award on that show. And I loved that match so much. That was that, up until that point, that was my favorite match that I've ever had. I just felt like everything clicked during that match. And then when I win, when I won that award, that like kind of validated everything for me. So I was just like, okay, I think this is it. So from here on out, I just have to keep, keep this feeling and keep like, keep this going, essentially keep the ball rolling. So Jordan, I just, uh, I remember when you first came into impact, like I had the pleasure of like, you know, helping produce your first match and stuff. So uh, that was a treat for me just because you, you had a lot of hype coming in and off, you know, like just hearing of you and all that kind of stuff, but you, you're young. Right. And you know, I, I know like back before this women's revolution and stuff, and you know, probably when you were younger, it was the whole like WWE with the, the women's lingerie and you know, all that kind of, T and A type stuff. I mean, I'm assuming you weren't a, a fan of that, you know, just judging by your style and stuff like that. So like what, what like got you into wrestling? I'm like, did, were you like despised by like, ah, oh, you know, this stuff is, you know, hokey or whatever. Like what kind of got you into it? I really liked, so I, I liked the guys wrestling more than I liked the girls wrestling back when I first started watching, actually. Uh, my favorite wrestler was, was Evan Bourne, who, <laughs> <laughs> Seidel. <laughs> who is Matt Seidel now, which is so funny because I, you know, I saw him all the time. I see him all the time on the Indies and we worked together a bunch of times. So it's funny how everything just comes full circle. And I really loved Beth Phoenix. Like she yeah. was one of my, my favorite wrestlers. And I was just like, man, everybody else is out here on lingerie and she just out here just being a bad bitch. And so I think like those it's, it's, it was a, maybe it wasn't wrestling itself. Maybe it was just those people and those characters that I loved and really helped me get into it. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned Beth Phoenix and in, in that, that era of, of women's wrestling, because they, you know, knowing Beth and whatever, knowing that they weren't given like a lot of time, they'd be given three to four minutes to do everything that they, they, they had. And you could never really showcase mm -hmm. what people could do. And now that this whole, or of what we have in professional wrestling is like, it feels like anything goes and like anybody can express themselves the way that they want. And now that you've been in the business a little bit, how important is that for you um, as a wrestler and for your character? And it, Cause it seems like where you're at in, at, at Impact, they sort of allow you to kind of explore who you are or what you're gonna become. 
And I think for obviously for wrestler, that's a, that's a huge thing. But for you, how important has that been and, and how has that helped you evolve? I think it's been extremely like important and fundamental, especially for me, like just being able to find myself as a wrestler and find out what I'm comfortable with doing um, in the ring. And I feel like there's, they don't have like this, uh, this control over you like some other companies do. So you can feel comfortable going to people and being like, this is, this is my idea. This is what I want to do. And, you know, 90% of the time they'll go with it and they'll, you know, coach you along to help you do whatever you want to do. Um, I just feel like impact is the best place for me to be right now, just because of that freedom and how you can do not, not, not necessarily whatever you want, but like, if your heart truly desires it and you tell them what, what you want to do, or you have this idea, they won't say no. They won't just say straight up, say no, like some other people will. You know, I've always been curious about wrestlers. If they had a dream to go up North, so to speak, and, or has that been a lifelong dream or has it been to the point where you know that if you go there, you might lose that character that you have, everything that you built up in the Indies and up to impact. Is, is that what you would rather have is to be an impact and be on the indie scene or eventually get, I mean, you don't have to answer it or not. But I just know <laughs> for me being a baseball player, you know, as a free agent, they always say, Hey, you want to go to the Yankees or to the Dodgers? And I was, Never inclined to want to shave my beard at the time. I had a nasty beard back when they weren't popular. Yeah, but I, oh yeah, I had some crazy hair too. <laughs> but I was I, I like to be at places where I was able to express my freedom and that being in Cincinnati and in Detroit and in, in Washington. So I know this is a long-winded question I turned into DMAC, but <laughs> so which one do you prefer? I mean Okay, so Yes, WWE was, it, it, I mean, it still is. It was my childhood dream for forever. Um, but that was the only option back when I was growing up. Now it's just like, there are so many doors that you could go through and kind of they're all like in front of you at the same time. So, I mean, it's kind of a, a, a handoff. Like I love the opportunity that Impact has given me. Um, but obviously it's going to be a lot less money than WW, WWE would give me if I were to go there and they would give me a lot less input on my character. So it just kind of depends on, you know, if I get older and I'm feeling like I need to be sit stacking some money for retirement, then I think that's a place I would probably go. <laughs> You, you say that, but we talk a lot on this podcast about how it seems like the mindset about going up north is no longer that's a major leagues. It's, you know, if I sign there for four years, my indie bookings will go up X amount of dollars. <laughs> it, 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 it's true, though, but it now becomes more of a, you know, I'll go there, I'll do my time, but you know, the last seven years of my career, that's when I will, you know, actually make the money. And it's, it's very intriguing to me about how that mindset of the whole industry is kind of coming. I want to use the word full circle because we're not back there yet, but where you started to where you are in the evolution of the whole wrestling industry, it's so topsy turvy for you. How do you make plans for the future when the whole business is just changing so rapidly? So, yes, I do think it's all very strategic. Um, and honestly, I, I have no idea what's going to happen when my contract is up with Impact in May. Like, I have, I have no idea. I couldn't, I, I can't foresee the future. And who knows who's going to offer me something or if I'm going to stay here. Like, I truly have no idea. And that's why wrestling isn't, like, you know, the best career path for some people because it's not very stable. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I got one more impact question. Just I asked this, it seems like to all of our guests. Um, so when you won the <laughs> knockouts title, all right, it's that Lars already knows, right? I just like to see people's, yeah. When you won the knockouts title. So how did that go? So like, for example, like, did they, did you know about it ahead of time? Did they tell you the day of like, um, you know, like I know, I remember how my title reigns went. Like, how, how'd that go for you? So I'm gonna be honest. 
I had no idea I was going to win the title until I think like that weekend. But I was actually, um, it's going to sound weird, but I was actually kind of disappointed because the week before we had actually had a pay-per-view and it was uh, in my, in like my hometown. And I thought that I was going to win it there and I didn't win it there. So I was like, okay, maybe I won't win it for a while. And then when I won it on TV, I was just like, oh man, why couldn't I have won it last weekend in front of like my parents? <laughs> but like, I got, I got over that pretty quick, but I was just like, dang, man, I just, I kind of wish I would have won it a little bit, a little bit sooner. <laughs> yeah, it might've been, you, you think, so I, I don't know, um, but you think that like, maybe, you know, they saw that match and they saw like, you know, your, your you know, fire reception, however, like, you know, how the people were behind yeah. it and stuff. And they were like, oh man we better put the belt on her. Like, do you think that's maybe how it went? That definitely could have been it. I have no idea. I mean, why they decided to pull a trigger, but I'm, I'm just blessed. It finally happened. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big win. I, I ended the the longest reigning knockouts reign. So it's pretty big for me. Yeah. It's huge. Huge. Uh, uh, On a kind of piggyback in that question, is there a rivalry in your household? Because when you, when you pick up a belt and maybe the, other person in the household is beltless do you go you know tonight i get to pick where we're going to dinner because i've got this thing and you don't i i, I know that's a goofy question it sounds dumb but you know when, what, yeah but when one of you guys is a champion and the other one's not does it make the other person step up their game and work harder is there a little kind of uh you know career rivalry between you two um n- no not really because like as wrestlers we know that usually everybody gets a title at some point in their career. And I mean, it's all about timing. Mm. So, I mean, me and John were holding titles at the same time a while back. He's held a title for what, almost a year now. And I've lost my title and like, we don't feel any type of way about it. (laughs) Do you ever get in arguments with him? Do you like go in your mind and say, I'm going to put that motherfucker in a sleeper hole right now? (laughs) (laughs) We argue about wrestling so much, like just because we're we have such different mindsets of wrestling. And I try to be more open minded because I know he's like, you know, 100 times better wrestler than I am. But it's still kind of uh, annoying sometimes. (laughs) We argue constantly about it. I want to get heavy and go back to this whole the change in the way women's wrestling is viewed. And us as men, we are part of the problem with the way we viewed it. And as PD kind of touched on the T and A error and all that kind of stuff. What do you feel like you have to go out of your way? You have to work twice as hard now today as you did maybe four years ago to change people's mind. Does it even matter to you? Um, it definitely matters to me. And I do feel like I have to work super super hard because I think there's you know there's still stigma in the back of people's mind like oh women's wrestling isn't as good as men's wrestling and I think that that can be true sometimes and I think we have to just work to overcome that 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 thought of mind and I know that a lot of a lot of promotions that I've been to especially indie promotions they like especially in the south because I'm from Texas obviously there are people who are just casual fans who, when there's a women's match on, they'll still cat call and do all kinds of weird, creepy men stuff. And like, we're not in that era anymore, but they don't understand that because they aren't as into wrestling as, as like some hardcore wrestling fans like you are. Like, obviously you wouldn't cat call a women's wrestler, but you know, some old man still will, still will. And so it's just kind of like, if we kill it tonight, maybe that guy will stop doing it, right? Well, you know, it's funny because I think, you know, I've been watching wrestling since the early 80s. So like Fabulous Moolah and like Jumping Bomb Angels and all that stuff. That was kind of like my first introduction. And when it became more of like the sort of fitness model kind of thing, I went to more of the Japanese wrestling and saw like, and I feel like for a long time, the Japanese women's divisions over there and even the companies over there were the, were the, the actual premier wrestling promotions for women so do you ever like go back and watch any of those old matches do you do you like how do you do your research do you is it something that you study tapes or do you go back and look at old stuff or 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 are you just kind of just learning on the fly still 
So the women's Japanese wrestlers, they have been killing it for like decades now. It just just now it has been pushed to the forefront. They just been like killing it for years. Um, I would love to watch like Japanese wrestler, like women's dress, Japanese wrestlers, but I can't do the stuff that they do. Like they just do insane stuff. And I don't, I honestly just don't have the cardio to do all the running that they do. And like, that's a lot of their spots are high spots. So they're just like running, doing all kinds of, of crazy stuff. Um, but as far as watching tape, honestly, I watched a lot of tape with, with John. So whatever he's watching is what I normally watch. I, uh, he was watching some uh, Doug Williams actually the other day, not the other day, like a few months ago. And um, I, the only thing I really picked up from it because uh, I know Doug Williams does the, the the chaos theory. So I did that at this last taping because I got it from Doug Williams. <laughs> well, I want, I want to mention that between all the wrestling between WWE, AEW, Impact put together the best women's division. The knockouts division is the absolute best. And and seeing Taya Vakery go up north, who's the locker room leader now that Madison Reigns is no longer there? Um, I feel like it, it's it's always been Gail, right? Like she's she's the one behind the scenes and she's the one coaching everybody to get better all the time. So even though she's not an active wrestler, she's always there cheering us on, giving us advice, agenting matches. She's just like, she's awesome. Cause, cause y'all are putting together tremendous matches. Y'all have a tremendous time on television. Do y'all like huddle up and like put things together? Cause we know that yours is not scripted. So, cause y'all have a lot of dialogue amongst each other and is, is really good product that y'all are putting out. Um, so what was your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it was just it was more of a statement okay. of just how y'all put everything together. I was just talk about every little detail because y'all have tremendous segments where other companies, the women's segment is not as long. Yeah, the, the writers there are really good with giving the women time and just giving everybody something to do, no matter who it is. Like all the women right now are in storylines. No one is sitting on the sideline. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's 100 percent true. Yeah. I might be mistaken, but I feel like for you, it all started at All In, where that was kind of your your overnight success, which wasn't really overnight. And I hate using that term, but it really kind of feels like all of a sudden you come on the scene at All In, then boom, you're an impact, and here you are, and it all explodes for the fans, the TV wrestling fans. It's overnight for you. It's not. Did you did you did you have a second to appreciate that moment of what all in was or was it just go 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 There was a, so there's actually a quote that I like that says you know it takes 10 years to build an overnight success and I really felt that like I felt that quote during that night because you're right that was that was it for me like that was the moment when everybody saw who I was and impact offered me a contract like a week later so it was really like the, it got the ball rolling and it just has kept going from there. But I, I got to soak it in because uh, at all in, were you there by chance? No, I watched on TV though. Okay. So when, when everything went off air, they actually did a thing where um, confetti dropped from the ceiling, like so much con confetti dropped from the ceiling and like lights were going off. And it was just like, it was magical to be honest. I have a video of it. And that was the moment that I really like had to take it all in. Cause it was just like, everybody was, so happy the vibe there was just like immaculate and it was just an awesome moment that i really got to breathe and take everything in so who noticed you to get you onto all in i mean i don't know exactly who it was but scott was the one that reached out to offer me the contract well that shoots that question down that i was going to ask so um <laughs> i'll ask a different one um <laughs> all right so I, I got to talk about this, this, uh, thick mama pump that you kind of made. All right. Yeah. So I, so Pete, just Pete, a little recap. Hang on Pete what? on, on the Tommy dreamer podcast. It was brought up. She did not know, by the way, if I'm spoiling anything, I'm sorry. She did not know exactly how it got started. So I, I did want to get to this point. So oh, that, that, that's why. Like, yeah. So like, well, I, I don't know. Just, I know, um, like one day on Twitter, I, I saw it. Like you, 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 you put a picture on there, and it. I don't, I don't even know if it said "thick mama pump," but you had the chainmail on. 
right? And I figured you, you do pictures like that all the time. You just wear whatever and whatever. And then all of a sudden it, it, it blows up huge. And then somebody like merged like the three of us together. Yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, and then, then bam, like we're all working together or whatever. So you, you, my question was like, well, I, I guess I could rephrase it a little bit different. Like, were you like, Hey, maybe if I throw this out there, this will be something. Did you ever think it would become something? I never thought it would become something. Um, I met Scott so many times before that. And I swear to God, he did not remember me. No, probably like, not. No. Yeah. Ever <laughs> he's just, he's just like that. Yeah. <laughs> like he probably, we've worked together. He probably still doesn't know who I am. <laughs> no, he, he knows now, like, you know, that we all work together. Yeah. We, we worked uh, together twice already. So. <laughs> It was funny how everything just like came together like that. I, I had no idea it was going to snowball into that. No clue at all. All right. Well, you know, what was funny is that uh, we were actually booked for uh, what was it? Chikara first. Yeah. Right? But impact actually like undercut them. And then we were used on impact. Yeah, first they were the like, Oh no, that's a good idea. We're going to, we're going to do that first. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely so okay well if you don't remember where it came from i mean you don't remember yeah i have no i have no idea i mean uh i think i might have put like a poll on twitter of like which do you think i should use as a moniker like a long time ago and one of the top ones that got voted on was thick mama pump and maybe i had posted a picture and and title it thick mama pump and then it just started to, to run rampant from there you don't use it as much. Is there a reason for it? Or is that something you wouldn't mind going back to? I, I use it all the time. What are you talking about? I, I mean, all I, I mean, at least on impact, it seems like it, it isn't brought up as much. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's on my, uh, what do you call it? My Titan Tron. Is it not? I don't remember. Honestly. Does it, I, it doesn't say it, does it? I don't know. I, I produce your matches and I don't like, Okay, I mean, maybe it doesn't, but it did for a I while. I thought it said Jordan Grace, and then it had your, you know, double. Oh, wow. well, oh, no, it's a different one now. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, so yeah. I, I feel justified here, guys. Hey, God. Okay. All right, all right. He got a week, Dennis Farrell. And I do use it a lot. I, I have them say it on, uh, on indies all the time. So maybe I just haven't been on as many indies lately. I wonder why. Uh. <laughs> All right. Well, I got, I got another, I got another one for you. All right. So uh, we were just talking about all in. So who, I don't, I don't even know who produced that match, but like, what was the, like, was it your idea? Brian's idea, somebody else's idea. It's like, you know, it'd be great if you eliminated Brian cage. I remember, you know, that was a big deal uh, that Brian was on that. I, I don't, he might've been our world champion at the time on impact or very close to it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think he was the, I think he was the world champ. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah. like, n not that you're a no name, but at the time it's like, no, nobody, like you weren't on TV. And then, you know, a female wrestler eliminates our world champion. And like, that's a, that's a big deal. Who, who came up with that um, idea? Do you know? Or do you guys so come up with it? I know that the, like the two main people who produced it was Tommy and Bubba. And I think I just kind of got lucky because Brian was supposed to get eliminated after like a long time. Like he was supposed to eliminate a bunch of people and he wasn't eliminated yet. And honestly, I think I just happened to be standing around during the time they were like, okay, so who's going to eliminate Brian? And I was just standing there and they're like, Jordan should do it. And I was like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Maybe I just got lucky on that one. Didn't Bubba, right place, right right you time. <laughs> Didn't Bubba beat you though? At, at the end? Yeah, Bubba eliminated me. So yeah. He had to get his comeuppance. Oh, I get it. That's perfect booking for him. Bubba <laughs> says, Brian goes through everybody. Oh, man, that's, oh. Brian goes through everybody. You eliminate Brian, right? He doesn't want to put himself over to say, I'm going to eliminate Brian. So who does he eliminate? The guy that eliminates Brian. Yep. Brilliant booking. Or, or in this case, the girl, the woman. Yep. I'm sorry. He's a genius, oh, man. The person, <laughs> the person that... I, well, you know, I, I mean, I use that general term, like what, what when we had the, my agent that... 12 women match i'm like guys guys hold on I oh my guys. god i whenever you were they said you were aging it i was like oh man i just i hope pd calls this entire thing <laughs> yeah and i you know spoiler alert i did but what um so <laughs> wow <laughs> just 
Barry Horowitz. So I know that I know that you know I walk away, right? And I'm assuming you guys are mfing me, like when I'm gone. Like, come on, spill the beans. Oh no, no one was doing that. Okay, well, everyone really liked it. I was yeah. I was kind of a like you know I was kind of a d bag because you know Gail gave me the heads up saying like hey you know, they're going to start talking over you and have their little side conversations and stuff. You're not going to be able to get anything done. So you got to put the kibosh on it quick. Uh, and, you know, she was right, but I figured that, um, you know, you guys were all like, Oh no, no MFing me behind my back and stuff. You're not no, I think, anyway, I think so. we all know, we all know that needed to be done. Like, or we would have yeah. gotten nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it was, it was good stuff. Uh, I don't know when it airs, but it's probably going to air soon. So everybody should check that out. Definitely. How protective of you are are you of your character going forward? And this is a question we talk, at least I ask a lot on the shows and we talk about a lot when we don't have guests is the evolution of a character, how protected they are, where they have the foresight to see their character going into the future. Do you, do you think that far ahead to where you want the, the Grace character to go forward? Oh man, honestly, I haven't thought about it very much at all. Um, <laughs> mostly because I don't, I don't know what the future holds, and I feel like whatever promotion I end up in, it's going to be kind of their say about what I do. I'm always going to be Jordan Grace, like you know, the powerhouse as a character, and it's just up to that company what they want to do with me. Well, I mean, that's a. I like your point of view. That I mean, that's like a very. You know, I'm just going to go with the flow. I mean, that's uh, a company, a producer. They they want that out of somebody. But I, I remember, um, you know, just coming up with other characters and other developments and stuff like that. Like if it wasn't for like Russo saying like, hey, man, you know, PD, you got to come up with something different than this Canada thing or else you're going to be. And, you know, that's when I came up with the muscle character and then the Steiner and stuff like that. Do you have any other characters in the back of your mind that's like, I would really like to do this. It's totally different than what my character is. Like it would be fun to do. Yeah. She's going to tell us on this podcast, Pete. <laughs> yeah. Right. Hang on. Jordan, do you want to give away all your money right here on this show real quick? Go ahead. I'm just going to shut up now. I've, I've never honestly thought of being anything else than who, than who I am. I'm not against it. I just, I feel like I'm not uh, creative in that, in that process. And I don't know what it is. I'm just not creative in that process. And I just, whatever opportunity is handed to me, I just want to go out and kill it no matter what character I have. I can see you doing like a bull Nakano thing, you know, just big old charged hair, crazy makeup <laughs> out there, just killing everybody. I want to be, a, I just, I just need a, I need to gather up some confidence to do that stuff. <laughs> see, that's, uh, you know, I think, I think you're anyways, I, I won't <laughs> no, you know what? <laughs> I see, I see her as a heel with a sinister smile because she has a sinister smile right there when you pose. Yeah, yeah. And, she was, and she was totally lying about the thing with Petey because you know that she totally mf'd him when he left. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I uh, I brought this up to um, one of the writers at at Impact. I brought it up to Jimmy, and I don't think he thought it was a good idea. But I was telling him like, I want to be the female Otis, and I want to just be eating all the time. Like, I want I want that to be my thing. I want in every promo I do, I just want to be eating something. I want to be at catering nonstop. I want to come out to the ring and be <laughs> like eating something with a fucking uh, protein shake in the other hand. Like, I don't even know what that character is. Just like <laughs> but, always but, trying to get gains. <laughs> it seems like an impact. You could just do it and get away yeah. with it and it becomes a thing. Yeah, I probably could, but <laughs> I don't you, know. You know I'm pitching that now, right? What The next time we do the <laughs> Swingers Palace thing, Cause that's where it seems like, you know, it's like a bizarro world. Like all, all like rules are off. I'm like, I could totally see you like playing poker at the table and, you know, and like just eating the whole, like, Oh, that's great. Now, yeah. You're, you're going to get it now. <laughs> just start doing all your promos by catering. That's what, that's what I wanted to do. I was like, going <laughs> like be next to the food and I'll just be eating. Yeah. I mean, you could do all your promos with your mouth full, you know, food flying out. I mean, online, there's like a very niche group of, of men who like call me fat and all that other stuff. And I think they would just love this. They would just like, totally they would. Shut them up. <laughs> yeah, it would, it would. Now, 
I, I want to go back and touch on this forbidden door thing. And I, as you kind of have laid out about your being a fandom in wrestling, and I'm not going to ask you the typical, who would you want to wrestle from a different promotion? Cause you get asked that on every show, everywhere you go, but do you have a thought process? Because this is all new us fans. We, Day by day, as the industry changes because of COVID and this company's in and out or they work together, look who showed up here. Do you, as a fan slash wrestler, because I know there's, it's, it's, you know, a balancing act there. Do you get kind of as excited as we do when you hear this company's in, this company's out, look who's showing up here or, you know, oh my gosh, Kenny Omega just walked through the halls. Do do you as a talent, get as excited as we do as fans? Hell yeah. When I saw uh, Juice Robinson at the last taping, I was like, oh shit, Juice Robinson is here. I was like texting John. I was like, yo, look, I guess who's here. Like, I get so hyped about that kind of stuff. I just think it's so cool. Do you have a storyline in your mind? You don't have to tell us, but like the perfect Jordan Grace storyline that would work perfect in this whole forbidden door angle? I just, you know, I just want the the knockouts to be able to go and wrestle pe- wrestle the woman at AEW in general. Like, I just think that we'd have killer matches and, like, they haven't even, like, had any ideas with the women to have them one way or the other. So I just want that, that forbidden door to get opened. I didn't even think of that. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, we have time for about one more question from each of us. Uh, Dimitri? Ooh, I have one question left for Ms. Jordan Grace. Well, you, wait, are you going to, um, Petey? Yeah. Is she going to get the belt? Because the knockouts division, oh, they, they always seem to just get the belt one time. It's one time. Everybody gets it one time. You know, I would, uh, I'll, I'll spoil it right now. Yeah, I, on Tuesday night, okay, it's going to be Jordan Grace <laughs> and Jazz winning the Impact titles, okay? So let, let's print that and put that up there. <laughs> no, I'm, not saying <laughs> now, I'm just putting the pressure on you, Petey. Yeah, I know. I mean, Gianna won it twice in, like, what, three months? So who knows? <laughs> yeah. I. <laughs> Pressure's on you, Petey. Yeah. What do you have, Lars? Go ahead, Petey. My question? Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right. So I'm going to ask what Dennis wouldn't ask because I really want to know this, and you get asked it all the time, but since that forbidden door is open, who (laughs) do you want to wrestle? I got to ask. I know I don't want to Dennis does want to ask. I want to know. That's stuff I want to know. So honestly, at AEW, I've wrestled a lot of the girls that already signed there. I've wrestled Britt. I wrestled Penelope. I wrestled Nyla. Um, but I think uh, the the one person I haven't wrestled in, and I actually came across in the Indies a bunch of times was Layla Hirsch. Mm. And I feel like we have a very we have very similar styles. And I know that she has a background in amateur wrestling, and so do I. So I feel like that would be a very interesting match. <laughs> Well, I'll ask mine, Lars. I'll let you ask yours when I'm done. Impact has been very forward thinking with its championship belts and with its women's talent. What do you think other companies need to do to fall? I don't want to use the word in line, but maybe be as forward thinking as Impact and allow women to be world champion as an X Division champion. I, I don't understand why in today's age of wrestling, Impact's the only televised company that really has done it recently do you think about that and do you have an idea what like maybe a ring of honor could do or someone else like that nwa i don't necessarily think that every company needs to open all their titles to women like i know that's not a very feminist thing to say but i don't i just don't think that i don't think that new japan should have to feature women's wrestling like if if we can have women's promotions that don't feature any male wrestling then why does New Japan have to feature women's wrestling? And I feel like that's that's an equality thing. Like, we can't have it both ways. And there's this argument that's like, well, if the women can wrestle for the men's titles, then why can't the men wrestle for the women's titles? And I do I do agree with that, that aspect of it. Um, so I just feel like it's all about timing. And especially with WWE, they have 
sponsors who don't necessarily understand wrestling very well. And I understand the need to keep those sponsors because we want to keep paying those wrestlers the amounts of money they get paid. Right. So I don't necessarily think that we need to push that thought process on all these companies at once. Lars. I want to go out with just a fun question and I hope you don't mind you and George, um, you and Jonathan in a cage, who's going over and what's the finish? Oh. Uh, <laughs> I feel we like- ask John? No, let, let's ask you. And then when we have John on the podcast, we'll ask him the same question. Go ahead. I'll get him ask him right now. <laughs> but uh, I feel like he would win. I don't know how he would win. I feel like he would, he would do something smart like he always does. He always has some kind of psychological thing that gets over with everybody and he would just get out of the cage somehow. Very good. And make us, make us both look good. Jordan, where can people find you online? Do you have a pro wrestling tea store, stuff like that? You can find me on all social media at Jordan Grace, J O R D Y N N E. Grace is spelled normally. And my website where you can buy micro brawlers, t shirts, eight by tens, whatever else is Jordan Grace Wrestler.com. Guys, anybody have anything else to promote real quick? Dimitri, Lars, PD. All right, guys. Listen, see what I did there. Uh, <laughs> once again, Fight Network, fighttv.com. Thank you guys so much for watching here on Fight. It's been a phenomenal show so far. We've had Jordan as our first guest. We're really excited. Uh, more to come. Wrestling perspective, anywhere you get it. And head over to YouTube. You can get the shows a day or two later there. And uh, we appreciate all the support so far from Fight, from the Wrestling Perspective fans. Jordan, thank you so much for hanging out. For everybody at home, the show is over. For Jordan, you'll have to sit here for a few more minutes and let's geek out over you. So uh, good night. Good luck, everybody. Enjoy your week in wrestling. Dimitri, Lars, Petey, say good night, everybody. Good night. Peace.